Hi, this is Lily DeHoya Sanderson, and you're listening to Choosing Glory. Thanks for joining me today. Just talking today about Mosiah 7 through 10, and this gets into some interesting movement in the Book of Mormon, where we start to see different groups and how they interact and come together. And anyway, we'll kind of explain that as we go along. I remember when I was teaching early morning seminary, I even did a handout that I'll probably post on Patreon, but a little bit later called Keystone Cops in the Wilderness. <laughs> so anyway, there's a teaser for the future that kind of explains how these different groups move around and miss each other and how they come together. So there's more to come and I will post that eventually. But right now we can keep it at least a little bit simple as we look at these chapters in the Book of Mormon. So we just had the end of King Benjamin's marvelous sermon, and we've seen this whole people who had been diligent and righteous. There was no contention. So they had set the spiritual foundation for their sanctification, and they were, in fact, sanctified as a people. As we said, that's not the complete end of the road, but that is a huge milepost in our qualifying for the celestial kingdom. And then if we persist and endure, we can have our calling election made sure, or at least be prepared for that final completion of the path in in resurrection. These things do not have to be finished in this life, but they definitely should be our direction. And sometimes I think we just set our sights too low because we don't think about these doctrines or we don't understand them. And so we are content with a lesser level of light or accomplishment. And we think that we are sufficient, which is not to say that we should always be beating ourselves up or full of self-doubt, but it is to say that we are capable of becoming gods. And that doesn't happen in a moment. That happens because we have chosen a path of increasing our light and truth and intelligence and applying it in our lives so that we can become changed, that we can be new creatures through the atonement of Jesus Christ and through the power of the sanctifying role of the Holy Ghost. Okay, just a review there, I guess. Now we're going to set the stage for this week by going back to Omni. Remember that short book, Omni, with five different authors? At the very end of Omni, and we didn't really talk about this when I talked about Omni because I knew it was coming up. Anyway, verse 27 to the end of that chapter, which is just three verses, this is the final author of Omni, Amalekai, who writes the most, as we mentioned a few weeks ago. And now I would speak somewhat concerning a certain number who went up into the wilderness to return to the land of Nephi. Okay, the land of Nephi is where they first settled, right? So Lehi and the family come to the new world and they settle and they call that the land of Nephi. They build a temple there, right? And then because of the murderous desires of the Lamanites, King Mosiah, the first, is inspired of the Lord to take his people further north, and they find Zarahemla, and they join with the people of Zarahemla, right? So that was discussed here in that quick synopsis that Amalekai gives, but now he's saying that there was a certain number who returned to the land of Nephi, for there was a large number who were desirous to possess the land of their inheritance. So they had, you know, some nostalgic feelings for that place where Nephi and Lehi first settled with their families and built the temple. And they are longing to go back and say, hey, we should be able to be in that land. And so this group went up into the wilderness and their leader being a strong and mighty man and a stiff-necked man. So, okay, he has you know, an idea in his mind, but he's kind of stubborn. Wherefore, he caused a contention among them, and they were all slain, save 50. So it must have been a big group if the survivors are 50. And they returned again to the land of Zarahemla, and it came to pass that they also took others to a considerable number. So they recruited more. They went back to Zarahemla, but they didn't give up on this nostalgic idea to go back to the land of Nephi. So they get more and recruit a larger group and took their journey again to the wilderness. And I, Amalekai, had a brother who also went with them, and I have not since known concerning them. I am about to lie down on my grave. These plates are full. I make an end of my speaking. 
So remember, this was the end of the small plates of Nephi that are now full and that the editor is going to describe why he included them. And that's why we have this marvelous record. But Amalekai had a brother who was in that group. Okay, so now fast forward. We're now in the reign of King Mosiah II. That was one of the purposes of King Benjamin's gathering all his people, right? One purpose was to designate and that his son Mosiah was going to be the next king and to kind of pass the torch to King Mosiah II. So this is the third in that righteous dynasty of prophet kings. Now we're talking about King Mosiah's reign. And in chapter 7, it begins right there. Now it came to pass that after King Mosiah had had continual peace for the space of three years, it was pretty early in his governance, he was desirous to know concerning the people who went up to dwell in the land of Lehi-Nephi. So he's like, what did happen to that group? Now, it's been a while because they left during the reign of Mosiah the first, it sounds like. But they've been gone a long time, and he wants to know whatever happened to that group. For his people had heard nothing from them from the time they left the land of Zarahemla. Therefore, they wearied him with their teasings. So it's not just Mosiah that's curious. It's the families or the friends of that group, that large group that left Zarahemla that second time and then didn't come back. So they're asking the king, can we find out what happened to those people? Like, shouldn't we know if they're okay or what's going on? So anyway, in verse 2, it came to pass that King Mosiah granted that 16 of their strong men might go up to the land of Lehi Nephi to inquire concerning their brethren. So he sends a group, 16 strong men. Verse 3 in Mosiah 7, it came to pass that on the morrow they started to go up, having with them one Ammon, he being a strong and mighty man, and a descendant of Zarahemla, and he was also their leader. So he's a Mulekite, or a descendant of Mulek, and that group that came with Mulek and formed the great city of Zarahemla. So they just make a note there that he was a Mulekite, and he's the leader, and he's a strong, good man. And they didn't know that, of course, they should travel, so they wandered many days in the wilderness. Forty days did they wander. And they pitch some tents, and he takes three of the brethren that are named here. That's in verse 6. And they meet the king of the people who were in the land of Nephi. So these three people, three men, so there are four of the 16 that leave the camp, and they go to see what they can see. And they come upon the king, who we're going to learn is King Limhi, who is the third in the list of people who came to settle. We'll get to that in a minute. So... King Limhi is out there in his chariot and outside the city and sees Ammon and these other three and they're coming close to the king and it's seen as a potential threat. So they're arrested basically and thrown into prison for a little while. So Ammon and these three people who were coming from Zarahemla to check on them come so close to the king that there's some panic ensuing and they bind them and put them in prison for a few days. And then Limhi causes them to be brought out to find out who they are. And that's all happening in chapter 7 of Mosiah. And Ammon gets a chance to speak. Verse 13, I am assured that if you had known me, you would not have suffered that I should have worn these bands. For I am Ammon, a descendant of Zarahemla, and have come up out of the land of Zarahemla to inquire concerning our brethren, whom Zenith brought out of the land. So Zenith was the original leader who brought the group down to the land of their inheritance. And now it came to pass after Limhi had heard the words of Ammon, this is verse 14, he was exceedingly glad and said, Now I know of a surety that my brethren who are in the land of Zarahemla are yet alive. And now I will rejoice. And on the morrow I will cause that my people shall rejoice also. So he's relieved to see Ammon knowing who he is, that they that Zarahemla is still functional and that they've sent out this scouting party to check on them. For behold, in verse 15, we are in bondage to the Lamanites and are taxed a tax which is grievous to be borne. And now behold, our brethren will deliver us out of our bondage or out of the hands of the Lamanites and we will be their slaves. So look, they're pretty desperate. Like he's saying, look, even if we have to come back to Zarahemla and be your slaves, that will be better than what we are dealing with here, being in bondage to the Lamanites and having to pay them this heavy tax. So thank you for coming, and I'm going to gather all my people tomorrow so that they can rejoice too and see that, that we're going to be liberated from this oppressive situation. 
And so he tells them to be unbound and they go and get the other 16 so that they can come. And they had suffered many things, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, and now they're going to be refreshed with Limhi's invitation to come in and, and replenish. And then he has everybody gathered to the temple in verse 17. And then in verse 18, O ye, my people, lift up your heads and be comforted, for behold, the time is at hand, or not far distance, when we shall no longer be in subjection to our enemies. Limhi is showing a lot of faith in Ammon and his brethren. He's like, it's going to be okay. They're going to help us get away from this oppressive bondage to the Lamanites, and we'll be free again and go back and join Zarahemla. And he's already, you know, acting like this is a done deal. <laughs> now that they're here, we can all rejoice because we're going to be okay. Be comforted. Behold, the time is at hand or not far distant. So he, he says, it might take a little while, but we're going to be okay. Notwithstanding our many strugglings, which have been in vain, yet I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. Okay, on a personal note, I was last week in the temple and I was spending some time in the celestial room and I was reading this chapter, which was coming up. So I picked up a book of Mormon there and I started to read chapter seven. And you know, I do a lot of praying in there. I'm still looking for comfort and peace and guidance and understanding Many of you, probably all of you, understand what that's like to be at a time of confusion or loss or grief or trouble when trials are large and confusing and we wonder, you know, what is God doing with us? And hopefully we trust and we keep our trust strong that there is a plan, that there is a customized curriculum. In fact, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, dear Elder Neil Maxwell, to whom I'm incredibly indebted for so much understanding over the years of my life. I started reading Maxwell when I was young and I'm not a perfect Maxwell scholar. I'm sure there are people who remember his stuff better, but I have read him my whole life and referred to him my whole life. And some things I have just never forgotten that he has taught. And I do feel so indebted to his writings and his speeches where I think, you know, so much of the theme was how to endure our trials, how to suffer well and to profit from our suffering, how to allow God to consecrate our affliction for our gain. So he's in my mind a lot as I'm going through this difficult time of loss. And as I, you know, talk to my kids and and sometimes, you know, review some of these concepts. It has been in my mind that this is something I learned from Elder Maxwell when I was very young. In fact, I think it was in high school that it was that we assented to our trials and maybe even volunteered for our trials, which is, you know, it's kind of a hard doctrine because I remember when I learned that concept thinking like, well, no, I would, <laughs> would not have chosen this path. And certainly at this time, I could see the natural man rising up and say, no, I don't want this. I didn't choose this. I didn't volunteer. But I think I did. I think we gave informed consent. I don't know exactly how the details of it went, but I don't believe that God just tosses us into random situations and that our lives just happen the way they happen, kind of willy-nilly. I don't believe that. I believe that for the righteous, there is a customized curriculum. So I know I've said this before, probably will say it many times again, but as I was there in the temple, wondering, okay, what did I agree to then? And what is it that I need to do going forward? And this verse really just stood out for me. Not one that I have ever really keyed on before, but it was these words at the very end of Limhi's first, you know, beginning of his speech to his people. There remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. So I'm just sharing that that has been in my mind a lot since I started reading and reviewing these chapters for this podcast. 
And I hope it will stay in my mind for as long as is needful, that there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. And I looked up the definition of effectual, and then I forgot to write it here, but basically it said, having sufficient force and commitment to bring about the desired results. So effectual, a little different from effective, which is more keyed on the outcome being positive, but this is more about the process, that we're bringing enough strength, enough force, enough commitment that will allow us to end up with the right outcome. And I'm working on that. I'm working on finding my way forward. There is an effectual struggle remaining in my life. And I want to not fall short of what the Lord has in mind for my personal custom curriculum. And I believe that all of us living in these last days have our own foreordained opportunities to fulfill that will help us magnify our callings and fulfill the purpose of our creation. And that all of us can be a part of this effectual struggle in preparing ourselves and our families and our those within our influence for becoming a Zion people, for becoming prepared for receiving the Lord in his second coming. There remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. Going on. In verse 21, Limhi gives a little bit of a review and fills us in with the rest of the history of this people. Ye are witnesses this day that Zenith, who was made king over this people, he being overzealous to inherit the land of his fathers, therefore being deceived by the cunning and craftiness of King Laman, who having entered into a treaty with King Zenith and having yielded up into his hands the possessions of a part of the land, the city of Lehi Nephi and the city of Shilom and the land run about. And all this he did, verse 22, for the sole purpose of bringing this people into subjection or into bondage. And behold, we at this time do pay tribute to the king of the Lamanites to the amount of one half of, you know, all their stuff. So it's a pretty burdensome tribute that they're paying to King Laman that was not part of the original deal. So Zenith is the grandfather of King Limhi who is speaking. So Zenith, who was the leader of that first group that left Zarahemla and then they have to go back because they kill each other. A lot of them do. And they recruit more and they come down again and Zenith becomes their king. And then his son is king and that's King Noah that we'll talk about plenty next week and refer to as needed beyond that. And then Noah's son is Limhi. So Limhi is the third generation after they left Zarahemla. Zenith Noah Limhi. And he knows that his grandfather Zenith was overzealous. And even Zenith says that about himself here in the record. But then in verse 25, how are they brought into bondage? If this people had not fallen into transgression, the Lord would not have suffered that this great evil should come upon them. But behold, they would not hearken unto his words, but there arose contentions among them, even so much that they did shed blood among themselves. And a prophet of the Lord, verse 26, have they slain. Who's that? That's Abinadi. They killed Abinadi, King Noah and his wicked court and his wicked priest. And the people assented, put him to death, who was trying to call them to repentance. So all of that is to come in more detail. Verse 29, the Lord hath said, I will not succor my people in the day of their transgression, but I will hedge up their ways that they prosper not. And their doing shall be as a stumbling block before them. So the Lord cannot subsidize sin. He just doesn't do that. And what a pattern for us that if we're going to be truly loving of others, we don't subsidize their sins. We've talked a lot about this, and that is so much that reverse of what's happening in our society and even sometimes amongst faithful members or people who are trying to be faithful members that think that, you know, we just have to love people so much that we just encourage or accept their behaviors. 
Now, this isn't about us trying to control others. People do have their choice, but we don't have to advocate for those choices. We don't have to become activists for whatever desire they may be pursuing, because that's not real love. God doesn't do it. He will hedge up their way. Now, again, I'm not saying we hedge up people's ways. There would have to be a pretty clear stewardship and command, but we can say that God does not want us to enable. And that's the word we use these days, but it's the same as this. It's subsidizing somebody's self-destruction. It's like having one of our kids continue in behaviors that are not good, like they're hitting their brother or sister, or they're lying or cheating or stealing. And we just say like, well, I don't know what to do. And we continue to give them privileges, or we continue to let them behave in these ways that are not going to help them have the spirit in their lives, that are not going to help them harness the natural man or help them learn how to be a civilized human being. And we just continue to sort of subsidize their behavior. This isn't about harshness or, you know, being angry all the time. It is about looking and saying like, what costs and payoffs am I allowing to happen here? Am I allowing this kid to just continue to be sufficiently rewarded that they're not going to change their behavior because life is comfortable enough or satisfying enough. That would be subsidizing. And this can happen in marriage, happens often in marriage because we we don't want to be contentious, which is good. But on the other hand, sometimes we continue to just provide love and support and I'm not talking about withdrawing love as much as I am looking at how we might be subsidizing or letting someone be really comfortable in their sin. This is all sort of a preliminary to the book that I am writing, and I'm getting back to it finally, maybe slow right now, but on boundaries, because God has boundaries. He doesn't subsidize sin, and that's what I'm trying to talk about in the book, and Hopefully we'll make some progress as the days keep passing. It's been really busy, surprisingly busy still. But then in verse 29, here we're at still at the end of chapter 7. Oh, that's the one I just read. So let's go on. And again, if my people shall sow filthiness, they shall reap the shaft thereof in the whirlwind, and the effect thereof is poison. That's the result of sin, and God will not get between action and consequence, because he loves us, and he's not going to protect us from those consequences if those consequences could be a disincentive. Verse 31, and again he saith, if my people shall sow filthiness, they shall reap the east wind, which bringeth immediate destruction. And 32 and 33, the last ones of the chapter, behold, the promise of the Lord is fulfilled, and ye are smitten and afflicted. But if you return to the Lord with full purpose of heart, that's always the answer to repent and put your trust in him and serve him with all diligence of mind. If you do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. Now, I just want to say something because here we are in what seemed to be the last days for sure. And of course, our leaders have told us that. And it, we are seeing a nation, those of us who live in the United States and some of the other Western parts of the world, other parts of the world where people... Well, particularly in America, where we've had this incredible promise that if we would worship the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, that we would be safe and protected as a nation. And then look what's going on. You know, fewer than half of the citizens of the United States even claim to be involved with a church. And atheism is really skyrocketing, or at least agnosticism. And people, you know, have abandoned the Ten Commandments or a Judeo-Christian code of any kind. And we see all kinds of craziness going on. So certainly abortion has gone out of control. Not that there was anything that was good about it, but we're talking about this push to make it so much the default. We're seeing our children attacked with incredible ideas that are destructive, where it really shakes the foundations of their identity. And this is being promoted and advertised and celebrated. I mean, come on, drag queen story hour? Like, how did we get there? Don't you ever have those flashbacks of like scenes from the Hunger Games where there's just like this insanity going on? And it's all seen as normal. 
Like, we're there, brothers and sisters. I mean, we're way past the Isaiah warning of evil being called good and good evil. We're into this insane time where we're just abandoning basic common sense and letting our children be bombarded with things that are so incredibly evil and confusing as a culture, hopefully not in our homes. Hopefully we guard the perimeters of our home in the ways that we've been counseled to and instructed to do. But we can't prevent some of their exposure. So here we are in this kind of crazy world, falling into transgression. But I take comfort in Lehi's statement. This is all the way back in Second Nephi chapter 1, but let's just read it for a minute. Wherefore, this land is consecrated unto him whom he shall bring. And if it so be that they serve him according to the commandments which he hath given them, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Wherefore, they shall never be brought down into captivity. If so, there's a warning, it shall be because of iniquity. That's just what Limhi has been telling his people because these principles are true. For if iniquity shall abound, cursed shall be the land for their sakes. But unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. Let's repeat that. Unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. I take great comfort in that. The world around us can fall apart. Society can fall apart. There can be insanity and craziness. You know, the inmates definitely haven't taken over the asylum. But unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. So wherever we are, whatever country, whatever situation we have, God makes promises to his people. That doesn't mean there won't be trials and struggles and commotion. All of that is prophesied. But we will be blessed through those difficult times. There is protection in the promises that God has made to his people. And Limhi is testifying of that to his people too. That if we turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart and put trust in the Lord and serve him with all diligence of mind, if you do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. The timing can be tricky. Sometimes it's much longer than we want it to be. But there is deliverance coming if we turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart. Okay, Ammon then gets the floor and Limhi asks him to speak to the people. And he, it says, shares King Benjamin's great sermon. So that's interesting. I don't know that he had any notes with him, but he was able to share the things that had been impressed upon him, taught to the people by King Benjamin. That's pretty remarkable. And then Limhi, after they speak to the people, talking with Ammon and his group again, have brought to him these 24 plates of pure gold, it says in verse 9 of chapter 8. 24 plates written in a strange language that they can't read. And he asks Ammon if he can read them or interpret them. And he tells them this story that he had sent a group to go find Zarahemla and tell them that they were hurting and, and bondage to the Lamanites and try to get help. So this band of men who are going to try to get help from Zarahemla are out in the wilderness. No GPS, you know, <laughs> I mean probably pretty easy to get confused and they couldn't find Zarahemla but instead they found a land that was full of bones now that must have been pretty marked you know of an experience for them to see that and so they look around and they find this record these 24 gold plates and they bring them back but they can't read them but they're really curious because what happened to this people that now there's this section of land that's just covered with bones. And so he's curious to see if Ammon can read those and divulge that mystery. But Ammon says, well, I can't, but I know someone who can. And it's King Mosiah. And this is in verse 13. He says, he has wherewith he can look and translate all records of ancient date, a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters. So that's a Urim and Thummim. King Mosiah is in possession of the Urim and Thummim. And that makes sense because they get... You know, Mormon puts those in the stone box that contains the plates that are delivered to Joseph Smith at the appropriate time in the restoration. And those interpreters are tools that can help with translation. But no man can look in them save he be commanded. This is verse 13 again. 
But whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer. And behold, the king of Zarahemla, who in the land of Zarahemla is a man that is commanded to do these things and who has this high gift from God. And the king says, a seer is greater than a prophet. That's verse 15 of chapter 8. And Ammon says, a seer is a revelator and a prophet also. And a gift which is greater can no man have except he should possess the power of God, which no man can. So he's saying until we become, you know, lifted to that level of deity and godhood in the hereafter, if we qualify for that great gift, you know, you can't have a greater gift than being a seer and a prophet. And why? Because verse 17, a seer can know of things which are past and also of things which are to come. And by them shall all things be revealed, or rather shall secret things be made manifest, and hidden things shall come to light, and things which are not known shall be made known by them, and also things shall be made known by them which otherwise could not be known. Do we celebrate this great gift that we have, that we have 15 men on the planet right now that we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators who can know of things in the past and of things which are to come. And of course, we had recently a general conference where they share that information with us according to the spirit that is in them and that they receive so that they can tell us how to understand the past and they can tell us how to prepare for the future. And then we are admonished to study those words for the next six months so that we can benefit from this gift that is greater than anybody could have short of becoming a God themselves. Are we talking to our children about this? You remember that story? It was a long time ago when the magazine of the church was still the ensign, but where somebody shared with a neighbor, non-member friend about the church and somewhere in the course of, of the conversation, he said we had living prophets and that I think he was speaking of the president of the church specifically and said, you know, there's a prophet on the earth today who can speak for the Lord. And then this interested sort of investigator friend says, there's a prophet on the earth today? Well, what did he say? What's, what's he saying? Anyway, the point of the story was that, like, are we reading the first presidency messages? Are we studying the conference talks? Are we celebrating that we have prophets and seers and revelators that speak to us every six months and in between. Because there's more stuff that I can keep up with in the firesides and the CES devotion, I know the BYU devotions or, you know, BYUI, anyway, BYUH, they, they speak all over the place. And I can't keep up with all the messages, but it's fun to try, isn't it? And some of you probably do better than I do, but what an incredible gift. And I'm just saying like, yeah, this is an incredible gift. And we can take these plates to King Mosiah, which they end up doing, and we're going to learn who they are. Now, this book with those 24 plates, the book of Ether. It's the record of the prophet Ether who explains about the Jaredites. That's whose bones are lying all over the land are the Jaredites who left the old world at the time of the Tower of Babel. So this is the most ancient record that we actually have in scripture is the book of Ether. Sometimes we think the Old Testament was written before, but that's not true. The Old Testament, which begins you know, at the beginning of creation, but was not written until Moses was directed to write that down. So Moses is the one who writes those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? So those are written by Moses, even though they cover information starting with the creation. The book of Ether was actually written way before the time of Moses. So it is the most ancient writing that we have in scripture. It doesn't cover as far back as the creation, but it was written well before Genesis. Just a little trivia there. So we're going to learn more about that later, of course, and that record is included by Mormon after his completion of the editing of all the books and his own book that he adds written by himself. And then those that record is inserted there, and then Moroni finishes the Book of Mormon with a few of his own writings, which also include some of the letters he received from his father or the teachings of his father that are incredibly precious and added by Moroni, who seals up the plates finally. Does that make sense? Kind of putting things together because it can get a little confusing. We have different groups 
but they all come together in the Book of Mormon. Now, chapter 9 and 10 are the writings of Zenith. Now, Zenith figures out some things, but he doesn't figure out everything. It's kind of an interesting character, right? And we're just going to talk about him a little bit, and then I want to zero in on a couple of messages. He says about himself in chapter 9, verse 3, I, being overzealous to inherit the land of our fathers, collected as many as were desirous to go up to possess the land and started on our journey again. So anyway, this is the second time they start out, and he recognizes he was overzealous. So he has gained a little understanding, but as I said, we're going to see later that he still didn't figure out some important things. Anyway, they were smitten with famine and sore afflictions, for we were slow to remember the Lord our God. So he sees that they weren't being inspired. They just kind of got this desire, this nostalgic desire to go back and inherit the land of the original settlement. And so they go and the king of the Lamanites gives them permission. But then in verse 10, it was the cunning and craftiness of King Laman to bring my people into bondage that he yielded up the land that we might possess it. So King Laman says, sure, okay, we'll give you a big portion of this land. But he has a long-term goal. He's playing this long game, and he really wants to bring these people into bondage. So after they had been there for 12 years, this is verse 11, King Laman began to grow uneasy, lest by any means my people should wax strong in the land, and they would not be able to overpower them and bring them into bondage. So I guess they're having children, and they're growing and prospering. And he's like, wait a minute, if they get too powerful or too numerous, I won't be able to execute my plan to bring them into bondage. And then I'm going to focus on some of the things that we hear about the Lamanites in these chapters that are pretty important. Verse 12, now they were a lazy and an idolatrous people. They worshipped idols, and that could be money, that could be stuff, it could be their own natural man lusts, all those kinds of things, as well as, you know, gods that they develop. But anyway, they were a lazy and idolatrous people. Therefore, they were desirous to bring us into bondage that they might glut themselves with the labor of our hands, that they might feast themselves in the flocks of our fields. So in other words, they're not willing to build, plant, develop in a way that would bring them prosperity by doing the right things, by worshiping God, but they see that the Nephites are. So they're like, hey, if we play this long game, we don't have to do the work, but we can get the gain. So it's a pretty, you know, obviously evil plan. And then what happens is that because they, King Laman is afraid that they are getting so numerous, he comes against them in a war to try to overtake, you know, to dominate and take over. But in verse 17, Zenith says, In the strength of the Lord we did go to battle against the Lamanites, for I and my people did cry mightily to the Lord that he would deliver us out of the hands of our enemies, for we were awakened to a remembrance of the deliverance of our fathers. So they know the history of Israel from the beginning, and even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that when they are righteous, the Lord fights their battles and can deliver them. Now, they had been slow to remember the Lord their God, but as they say, no atheists in foxholes. Explain to your children what a foxhole is. A lot of them don't know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, where in war, if you're on kind of a flat plain and the enemy's over there, you don't want to just be on the surface of the land where you're, you know, easy targets. But scraping out, you know, a shallow place where someone can be under the surface of the plane so that they're not as vulnerable to being shot or attacked or, you know, blown up. And it has been said for a long time, no atheists are in foxholes because when you're that vulnerable to death or destruction, all of a sudden you believe in God. Well, that's what happened to the people of Zenith. And God did hear our cries and answer our prayers. And we did go forth in his might. Verse 18 here of chapter 9. We did go forth against the Lamanites. And in one day and a night, we did slay 3,043. And they drive them out of the land. And with his own hand, helps to bury their dead. And behold, to our great sorrow and lamentation, 279 of our brethren were slain. So, you know, quick math there you know, it's over 10 to 1 of the losses. So those slain in that battle, there were over 10 Lamanites slain for every Nephite that's slain. That's a really big slaughter for the Lamanites. Now they are really sorry, of course, to lose their people, but they do see that the Lord helped them tremendously and that the Lamanites suffered 
a more significant loss. And that does discourage the Lamanites, right? So it says that now at Zenef in chapter 10 tells them they've got to create weapons and stuff and set guards around so that the Lamanites don't catch them unawares again and destroy them and they guard the flocks and whatever. And there's three of chapter 10. We did inherit the lands of our fathers for many years and for the space of 20 and two years. So they do have a period of time where they're being pretty vigilant and guarding against the Lamanites and they remain in the land. And so they keep growing grain and fruit and whatever, and the women spin and toil and work cloth of every kind, and they prosper in the land, have continual peace for a space of 22 years. And then in verse 6 of chapter 10, King Laman dies, and his son starts reigning in his stead and starts to stir his people up to war again against the Nephite group. And so they start to see this preparation for war and in verse 10 at the end, we did go up in the strength of the Lord to battle. So they have to fight again. Verse 11, now the Lamanites knew nothing concerning the Lord or the strength of the Lord. Therefore, they depended upon their own strength, yet they were a strong people as to the strength of men. So they, and then it goes on and says they were a wild and a ferocious and a bloodthirsty people believing in the tradition of their fathers which is this, and he explains the belief that is being passed on from one generation to another in the Lamanite nation. And what is that? That they are the victims. There's a victim mentality that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren. This is in verse 12 of chapter 10 and wronged while crossing the sea. Well, come on, you remember what happened when they're crossing the sea? Their forefathers bound Nephi to the mast. And it wasn't until they feared that they could be lost and perish on the ocean there because of the tempest that was driving them back. They finally relent and untie him, not because of the pleadings of their father and their mother, not because of the pleadings of his wife and children, but because, and certainly not because they were prompted by any positive repentant emotion, but because they think they're going to die. So it's kind of, okay, I guess we're going to have to let him go. And they do. But now they've got this whole story spun so that they're the victims and their fathers were wronged on the sea and wronged in the wilderness and then wronged when they got here because what is their story? Their story is that finally Nephi, oh, well, let's just tell the true story here. Verse 13, all this because Nephi was more faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, he was favored of the Lord, for the Lord heard his prayers and answered them, and he took the lead of their journey in the wilderness. So <laughs> why did this happen? Because Nephi was obedient, and their fathers were not. And his brethren were wroth with him. Verse 14, and they understood not the dealings of the Lord. Now, we've, used, we've talked about that phrase before. We talked about that back in 1 Nephi where it says that Laman and Lemuel knew not the dealings of that God which had created them. And how important that is, that when we don't understand God, we get everything wrong. And here it is again, you know, they didn't understand it, speaking still of these people who blamed Nephi for their problems without, you know, they just didn't look in the mirror. You know, brothers and sisters, it's not always our fault that there are problems. That's true. But that should always be our default setting. And one we should teach our children too. If there's a problem, the first thing you do is look in the mirror. Or we could say, Lord, is it I? That question is really important. First, let me look at myself. Let me look to myself and let me be prayerful about it and ask the Lord, is there something here that I need to do better? Do I need to repent? Do I need to change? And you know what, brothers and sisters, even if somebody else is the chief instigator of the problem, there are always things that we can learn areas where we can grow, things we can improve, faith that can increase, patience, long-suffering. We can become more steadfast. Our faith can really expand in the dark, as we've talked about before. Always the first question, Lord, is it I? That's really important, and I hope we are teaching that to our children. Look to ourselves first. But anyway, here's the tradition of the lame nights. That Nephi, in verse 16, departed into the wilderness as the Lord commanded him and took the records with the plates of brass. And now they say he robbed them. And thus, verse 17, they have taught their children they should hate them. 
and they should murder them and they should rob and plunder them and do all they could to destroy them. Therefore, they have an eternal hatred towards the children of Nephi. That is the tradition of their fathers. And they pass it down from one generation to the next. So how evil is this to teach our children that they're victims, that it's always somebody else's fault? Oh, you were robbed. Your forefathers were robbed. And and do we see that in our society? Like all the time. I mean, and it's worldwide. Colonialism robbed our people. I'm not saying anybody is perfect. And I'm not saying that there haven't been offenses done. But can you see that victim mentality all over the place? You know, somebody came and took our stuff. We really are the rightful owners of this land. I remember somebody asking, you know, or talking about how all the land should revert to the indigenous people who owned them first. And they said, well, who would that be? Because like, speaking of America, you know, which tribe are you going to give that to? Because there were lots of Native American tribes and they kept taking the land from one another. They made each other slaves. They got, so who does it go to? Like, like, <laughs> I mean, there's a point at which you just have to say like, okay, here we are. How do we try to live justly? How do we try to give equal opportunity, not equal outcomes, but equal opportunity, which is the way the Lord presents justice is that we try to deal justly and fairly, but we don't go back and say like, oh, you were so victimized that so we have to give you everything back. I mean, and look at where this is really evident right now is in the Middle East. The Palestinians are claiming that they were robbed. Does that sound familiar? You know, this was our land. Well, you know what? They never had a nation. They never had an organized government. They were kind of nomads and they, nobody else wants them because they're terrorists. So there are lots of Arab countries who could have easily welcomed them. And they even have a border. One of the borders of Gaza is Egypt. Are they taking in the Palestinians? They don't want them because they are, they're an angry people. And they teach this tradition to their children. Now, I don't, sorry if this is offensive to anybody. I'm not saying all the Palestinians are evil. I'm not saying all the Jews are righteous. Individually, people make their decisions and they can be good or evil. Are there innocents involved? Are there innocents being hurt? Yes, as there always are in war. So please understand, I'm not just trying to wipe off this whole people and say that they're, you know, just all evil or corrupt, but the traditions are not righteous. In fact, how tragic is this? I saw that some interviews about this and I looked up some things to make sure I had, you know, some facts about this. And this is an article from May of 2014 talking about a Palestinian children's show, which is called Pioneers of Tomorrow, but it's kind of a Sesame Street format. So it's definitely for children with some puppets and things like that. So it's a very much like Sesame Street. And this was broadcast on May 2nd of 2014 and uploaded Thursday. Anyway, this is back, like I said, 10 years ago. The host of the program, a young girl in a hijab, interviews two very young children, one of whom says she hopes will be a police officer like her uncle Ahmed. The host asks what policemen do, and after establishing that they catch criminals, adds, they shoot Jews, right? And stresses to her young guests that you want to be like him. I will shoot the Jews, the little child says. This is on their children's kind of Sesame Street style program. So this little girl who's being talked to here says, I will shoot the Jews. All of them, the host asks. Yes, the girl says. Good, the host answers. <sighs> I've seen little snippets of cartoons that are shown on Palestinian TV that are, again, designed just for the children that show throwing rocks and using bats and clubs to hurt Jews and being celebrated for that. So, I mean, yeah, the propaganda is horrific. You see the connection here? Like, let's not be glib in our understanding about this. The Lamanites were not just innocent victims that the Nephites just kept causing trouble with. No, the Lamanites taught their children to hate the Nephites. They distorted the story so that the Lamanites could see themselves as victims and the Nephites as the oppressors. And shocker, the Nephites, it, when they are righteous, prosper. 
and they are a productive people, not lazy and idolatrous. So they have all kinds of wealth that grows when they're not caught up in their pride cycle and they are prospering. The Lamanites are jealous, but do they think to turn with full purpose of heart to the Lord and repent? Well, we do see some groups much later now, well, a little bit more in the future here in the Book of Mormon who will repent and come to the Lord with full purpose of heart. So this isn't about, you know, racial preference or political preference. This is about, are we doing what's right? Are we turning to the Lord so that he can keep his promises to us? And he invites all and denies none. But we cannot teach our children that they're victims. And we need to point out to them the problems with those kinds of traditions that act like everybody who doesn't prosper is a victim. Some are. I mean, we have to be wise enough to look at circumstances. And King Benjamin tells us not to you know, judge the beggar and, and blame him for all his problems, because there are things that happen to people that are unjust or unfair or, or difficult. So we should be inclined toward blessing people and helping. And especially when there's so much prosperity in the nation, as we've said, there's a level beneath which no one should sink when so many have so much. Nevertheless, we need not to be foolish and we need to be wise enough to understand what are the kids being taught and how will it affect their ability to make good choices and come to the Lord with full purpose of heart and understand that that is the answer to life's problems. That doesn't mean that we won't have trials or that we won't have struggle or tribulation because we're here for a purpose and that purpose is refinement. It is to help us reach our potential. Wow, I'm not getting to some of this material that I want to cover, so i got to move forward. But I am going to say that there are a lot of things online if you want to look about how some of these traditions are being perpetrated. And even money being given that isn't being overseen so that it's used for propaganda, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA. You know, there were kids that are in these camps that are United Nations camps funded by donations from Western countries. And they were interviewing the kids about what they were learning and what was in their books. And it was celebrating some of the terrorist martyrs, martyrs, meaning, you know, they like were suicide bombers or whatever. And, act, you know, and acting like those are role models for these kids, that they should want to be like them. And this is UN money going to that. It's pretty disturbing, frankly. So there were these two teenage boys that were being interviewed. And this was back quite a while ago. Do I have a year here? Oh, four years ago. There's a YouTube video about UNRWA and the propaganda that's coming from even these UN camps where children are taught. And one young teenage boy, you know, says there's no two state or a peace solution. A lot of people in the world are saying, oh, we just need a two state solution. That's not what these kids are being taught. It's four years ago, right? It is one state and it will be Palestine forever. And a second teenage boy is interviewed on camera. And his statement is, what was taken by battle will be reconquered through battle. We must conquer our land by force. This land is our land. There is no way to divide it. So, I mean, we're fooling ourselves if we think or listen to some of the, you know, commentators out there who are saying that like, oh, we just need to have a peace deal, and then everything will be fine. Can you have a treaty with people like the Lamanites who are taught from their infancy that they should kill you? A lot of work to be done, but the answer isn't to say like, well, you know, it'll all be fine if we just leave them alone or divide the land. This has been tried, right? What are we teaching our children, brothers and sisters? Look at some of the dogma that is happening in our own country and our own societies in the West where we're reversing the two great commandments. We talk about that all the time. The love for our neighbor should supersede our love for God. And that it means that we can turn our back or water down the commandments of God because we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Are we backing up from God's divine definition of marriage between a man and a woman? Are we apologizing for that instead of celebrating that we have prophets, seers, and revelators who have told us that this is the way of God and this is the way of happiness? Peace in this life and eternal joy in the world to come. Are we softening the doctrine about men being men and women being women? That God created us like that and not 
that men can become women and women can become men or that it doesn't matter who you love or, you know, a trans woman is. I'm, like, what are our kids hearing? And are we correcting that clearly enough and saying, yes, this is not about hating anybody. We, we do need to love our neighbor. We need to have love and compassion for people who are confused. But that does not mean we compromise the truth or that we apologize for it, or that we're ashamed of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his doctrine and gospel. <sighs> I'm going to do some extra content on culture so that we can have a tool, and it's a great tool that my mother used to teach in her sociology classes, <laughs> and it's actually Talcott Parsons' model of the pattern variables of cultural orientation. That sounds confusing, but it's really pretty clear. Five dichotomies. And we can see where the gospel stands up and you can look at almost any culture. Well, you can look at any culture and see where it lands on these five dichotomies. And that tells you how close it is to gospel culture. So anyway, I think that will be interesting for some of you. So I haven't recorded it yet, but that will be coming. And I won't wait too long to get it done. I want to get that done. I looked up and make sure I had the five dichotomies right. Most of them I can remember, but sometimes I miss one when I'm trying to remember them. So I found them all five, and I'll be talking about that. Then without our changing our culture, which is what Zenef learned finally, or Limhi talks about, we need to return to the Lord with a full purpose of heart. That is a cultural change. That's letting go of evil traditions or evil ideas or sophistry or the philosophies of men mingled with scripture. When we turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart and we listen to the prophets, seers, and revelators and we replace sophistry or correct sophistry that is around us and help our children understand the difference so that they can be appropriately evaluative, they can be critical thinkers and not just be blind to those kinds of misinformation campaigns. Do I, do I use that word? Anyway, propaganda, which can really seduce them into incorrect cultural beliefs. And we are seeing those things change all around us in the world as prophesied so that even the elect were it possible could be deceived. So we really need to swim upstream, your brothers and sisters, and push back against the current that is around us all over and turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart and help our children see the safety of doing that. So some fun information that I will save. Hmm, do I want to save this? Yeah, I think I do. It's pretty fun, but <laughs> we'll get to that. Then I do want to talk about zeal for a moment. And there's going to be some extra content on this as well. I need to time this with my son Harper, who had some notes that he shared with me on zeal and how in some ways it has a bad rap now because we have this mention in the Book of Mormon of Zenith being overzealous, which was definitely a problem. Maybe you remember that Aristotle said once that every virtue carried to an extreme is a vice. That would be overzealousness, right? But zeal itself is commendable, the correct kind of zeal. So anyway, Harper and I are going to have a discussion on that, and I'll post that on Patreon as well. Yeah, some good notes on zeal and has thought about that a lot. We've had some fun discussions. So We'll do that one together. So I'm not sure exactly when that'll happen, but he's been super busy right now with work, but he's sees a break coming up. So maybe we can get that done before too long. I do want to quote a little bit from Hugh Nibley's wonderful essay on zeal without knowledge. It was actually a speech that he gave at BYU many years. And I probably will save some of this also for extra content, but here's some of it. His point is that zeal, which, like I said, is a good thing, has to be attached to knowledge, to truth, to good cultural patterns, to the Lord and to what is revealed through our prophets, seers, and revelators, and that we should acquire knowledge by study and by faith. So, yes, we should do our due diligence in seeking out of the best books, wisdom, and so on. We also need to be prayerful about it. We've talked a lot about this lately, and we'll continue to talk about how here we are in an information age, and we have less access to truth than ever, because it's distorted, it's spun, it's difficult to discern what is actually accurately reported and what is not. So the irony is huge, but if we are going to be safe and righteous, we need 
We need to be knowledgeable. It's not going to work to just say, oh, it's too confusing. I don't understand what's going on. We do need to prayerfully decide what to study. We don't need to keep up with every fad or every little news item. I don't mean to say that, and I don't mean to get obsessed about everything that's happening in the world. That's not useful. Nevertheless, if there's something that concerns teaching our children or that's going on that is affecting our families, we do need to know what that is. We need to be critical thinkers and teach our children to be critical thinkers, to be evaluative, to understand implications. We've talked about this before. It's so important in a world where truth is so distorted. To help them think, does this line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is this in harmony with what we are told by our prophets, seers, and revelators? If I turn with full purpose of heart to the Lord, is this the behavior he desires of me? Am I following his ways and the example of his son, All of this becomes increasingly important in a world where propaganda abounds, where distortions abound, sophistry abounds. Brothers and sisters, we can do better. We don't have to fall into the modern traditions. We can hold to the truth and teach our children to follow that path as well. But anyway, quoting from Nibley a little bit. Woe unto him that wasteth the days of his probation, for awful is his state. And of course, he's quoting 2 Nephi 9. It is throwing our life away to think of the wrong things. And as we are told in the next verse, the cunning plan of the evil one is to get us to do just that. Trying, in Brigham Young's phrase, to decoy the minds of the saints. That's a great warning. To get our minds on trivial thoughts, on the things of this world against which we have so often been warned. Sin is waste. It is doing one thing when you should be doing other and better things for which you have the capacity. Hence, there are no innocent idle thoughts. He's really really on this, right? There has to be knowledge so that we can have appropriate zeal. That is why even the righteous must repent constantly and progressively since all fall short of their capacity and calling. Probably 99% of human ability has been wholly wasted, writes Arthur Clarke. Even today, we operate for most of our time as automatic machines and glimpse the profounder resources of our minds only once or twice in a lifetime. No nation can afford to divert its ablest men into such essentially non-creative and occasionally parasitic occupations. <laughs> and of course, Nively likes this because even though this is Arthur Clarke, he agrees with these specific things. Occupations as law, advertising, and banking. Okay, I'm not saying you can't be a lawyer or in advertising or banking, but should that be the total focus of life? We need to go past that to use our potential is what's being said here. Those officials whom Moroni chides for sitting upon their thrones in a state of thoughtless stupor, and that's from Alma 60, were not deliberately or maliciously harming anyone, but they were committing grave sin. Why do people feel guilty about TV? Okay, I'm guilty of that sometimes. What is wrong with it? Just this, that it shuts out all the wonderful things of which the mind is capable. I actually don't watch a ton of TV, but I do like watch movies sometimes, try to keep them okay. And I probably, I do overdo it. I mean, I'm, I want to know what's current so that I can kind of understand and incorporate that into applications of the gospel. So I do listen to news interviews and so on, but I find that sometimes I need to be more picky. And I'm thinking like, okay, that was, you know, a half an hour I'll never get back. Or even 15 minutes I'll never get back, which was just a repetition of propaganda or somebody's opinion or whatever. Now, there are some thinkers that I really like listening to because they are good critical thinkers. Or they know something about an area that I'm not as well informed in as I and I'll even take notes sometimes because I do learn in that way. But, you know... I can see that being selective is really important and that there are times where I'm watching some, you know, escape something that I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that's a time I'm never going to get back. And Nibley is reminding us that 
that we have greater potential than that. And we can waste a lot of time and waste a lot of brain power on the trivial. So anyway, I think it's a great warning. What is wrong with it? Talking about TV, just this, that it shuts out all the wonderful things of which the mind is capable, leaving it drugged in a state of thoughtless stupor. For the same reason, a mediocre school or teacher is a bad school or teacher. The newspaper once announced that a large convention concerned with violence and disorder in our schools, and think back on Nibley's day, nothing like what we're seeing now, came to the unanimous conclusion, students and teachers alike, that the main cause of the mischief was boredom. Underperformance, the job that does not challenge you, can make you sick. And sisters, that's for us too, as mothers. You know, yes, there is a lot of repetitive work that needs to be done to keep a household running. Routine needs to happen. And yeah, the laundry's never done and people need to eat <laughs> again and again. And kids need to be bathed and all of that. But but do we approach it just that way? Or do we realize that maybe I'm underperforming if I'm not seeing that this is more about, yes, providing an appropriate setting for my family where we are fed and taken care of and so on. Hopefully both husband and wife working together in that task, although yeah, moms, if we're full-time at home, which I hope we're able to be, and I know it's not always possible, but that is largely our task. That's our part of the division of labor when our children are young. But are we underperforming in terms of just seeing it in its pedestrian capacity, or are we looking at like, this is about helping our children feel the spirit, creating a home where the spirit of the Lord can dwell, making sure that they are treating each other right and that they're treating us right and that they are respecting their parents and learning to respect each other. Are we seeing this as an opportunity to introduce them to prayer and to their Father in heaven and Jesus Christ and teaching them? As it says in Deuteronomy, I've always loved that verse, when thou risest up, you know, talk of these things with thy children, when thou risest up, when thou liest down, and when thou walkest by the way. That's what mothers can do. Are we underperforming? Please don't underperform. Please Seek the Spirit and ask for the guidance of the Spirit and fill your minds with good things and a testimony of the doctrine so that we can talk to our children about these things in a very natural, day-by-day -day way, not preaching, not, you know, being ridiculous about boring them to death, but like sharing these wonderful scripture stories, teaching them principles, helping them interpret what they see in the world it, with the eye of wisdom, with knowledge. Anyway, don't underperform any of us, brothers and sisters. Do not, do not sell your birthright for a mess of pottage. Work that puts repetition or routine in the place of real work begets a sense of guilt. Merely doodling and noodling in committees can give you ulcers, skin rashes, and heart trouble. God is not pleased with us for merely sitting in meetings. That's nice, isn't it, <laughs> to remind ourselves of? How vain and trifling have been our spirits, our conferences, our councils, our meetings, our private as well as public conversations, wrote the prophet Joseph from Liberty Jail. Let me say that again. How vain and trifling have been our spirits, our conferences, our councils, our meetings, our private as well as public conversations, wrote the prophet Joseph. Too low, too mean, too vulgar, too condescending for the dignified characters of the called and chosen of God. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to stop there. But I will continue that with some extra content. There are some other beautiful things <laughs> that Nivley says about filling our minds with knowledge and I think it's worth sharing and it's inspiring to help us set our sights higher. We have the capacity of God's. God made us in his image and he has all light, truth, and intelligence. And we don't go from zero to 60, but we can be on the path. I quoted this just last week from section 50 of the DNC. He that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Added to that, we can't teach what we don't know anywhere or any more than we can go back to where we ain't been. Chris used to like to quote that. Let me say it better. We can't teach what we don't know any more than we can go back to where we ain't been. We need to learn so that we can teach, so that we can elevate the conversations in our households, so that we can talk about the things that matter. 
And it's not boring. My parents were really good at this. I really tried to follow that example of talking about principles and wonderful things. And it didn't always have to be a sacred subject, except if we want to extend the definition of that to all light and truth. You know, we could talk about history and learn lessons from great men and women who've lived before or great events that have shown what people are capable of and that also have demonstrated that evil exists, but that righteous people can resist it. And the Lord will bless us just as he did the people of Limhi. First Zenith and then Limhi. I did want to mention that the part where Zenith didn't seem to learn his lesson is mentioned right here in the very last verse of his record in chapter 10. And now I, being old, did confer the kingdom upon one of my sons. Well, who was that? It was Noah. Now, he had other sons. We don't know if they were any more righteous or less righteous than Noah, but he chose Noah to confer the kingdom on. And Noah was a terrible, unrighteous king who leads the people into bondage. So, he says, may the Lord bless my people. Amen. But how did he bless the people? By giving them Noah as a king? Now, we don't have information. Maybe Noah was righteous in his youth and then went south. I don't know. But he, hmm, there are often indicators early on that of how people are going to be. And it doesn't seem like Zenith really gained enough wisdom. So he passes the kingdom to one of his sons who brings about disaster for this group. We'll talk about that next week. In the meantime, remember that zeal is good, but it has to be accompanied by knowledge. Let's not waste our time. As Nibley says, wasting our time and intelligence is a sin. We have greater capacity as we go through even the routines of life, we can be more consecrated in our efforts. We can use it to set an example for our children, to teach them of all the ways that the world testifies of the existence of God and of our Savior's love. We can do this, brothers and sisters. There remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. Let's choose glory. Let's build Zion. Thanks to my dear husband, Chris Anderson, and to Doug Larson of Point Digital. Take care. <laughs>